Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, a very good evening to everyone. How are we? Somebody said, great. I should give you a chocolate, man, for that one. It's so good to be back, guys, and uh, to be with you. As I always say, you know, I look forward to Friday nights, um, you know, to, to see all these beautiful faces. It's been three weeks that I've been away and uh, just came back from the Holy Land trip. And uh, we've, we went to Israel and France, Lourdes. I pray that, you know, you'll have the chance to go and visit the Holy Land because it is a trip of a lifetime if you haven't um, done that as yet. Any new faces for the first time with us, by any chance? All old faces, no new faces? <laughs> That's good stuff. New faces? No? <laughs> oh, one. That was lucky. <laughs> That's good. <clears throat> okay, tonight, my beloved, I'd like to... And please uh, excuse me because I am extremely tired. Just came back from a two-week trip, sick one week, went to Melbourne for two or three days, and just came back today uh, from the airport. So uh, I am a little bit exhausted, uh, so my apologies if I don't sound myself. Please excuse me, and if you don't like it, tough luck. Uh, you can buy me a fish burger and a chocolate sundae, and I'll be your best friend. Tonight I'd like to um, talk to you about, I believe it's a very important topic, and it's to do with spirituality, our spiritual life, uh, our spiritual destiny and the path that we walk in as Christians. You know, being Christians only is not enough. We need to be a good spiritual Christians in order to understand uh, what is our really purpose in life and what does the Lord Jesus expect uh, from each one of us and how we should live our life as Christians, followers of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the only true divine God. I'm going to call this topic, which is going to be sort of a discussion with you guys. I'm not going to preach uh, or teach, but it's uh, sharing some secrets, uh, sharing some uh, spiritual information for you not just to absorb information, but to implement it with the Lord's grace in your life. I call this discussion Secrets 
of the spiritual path, secrets of the spiritual path or way. I'll give you a very simplistic, a very simple, straightforward curriculum. You know, like when you go to school and they give you the curriculum in school. So I'm going to give you a very basic, simple curriculum for the secrets of the spiritual path. And I'm going to put it in three different panels. These secrets of this path, I'll put them in three different panels. And they are all linked to one another. The first panel is that the believer with his, with his or her own self. The believer with other people around themselves. And then the third one is the believer between themselves and God. So the first one is the person between him or herself, the person or the believer between himself, herself, and others and the believer between him and herself with God himself. And I will give a foundation for each one of these different panels, a foundation for you to build your life on. A believer with his or her own self, between you and yourself. How should you live, walk in a spiritual way? How should you live and walk in a spiritual way between you and yourself? The very first foundation that we need to build ourselves on in order to be able to live with myself in harmony and in peace, the foundation I should build myself on is humility and humbleness. I should ask myself, am I a humble person? Am I a down-to-earth person? Do I have too much self-pride? Am I one of those people that wants to be seen, who seeks attention? Am I an attention seeker? Do I really expect for the world to revolve around me? Everybody's got to look up to me. I'm the star of the day. I'm the guy in the block and around the block. The very first thing that I need to build myself on in order for me to be living in, with an inner peace in me. How often do we struggle from inside? How often do we have our own challenges, our own battles, our own tribulations from within? How often do we go through that? Do you want to find a solution for all this, seek humility. And when we seek humility, and that is a gift from the Lord Jesus, and the Lord said, ask and you shall be given. Seek, you will find. Knock and the door will open for you. So we need to ask the Lord Jesus to give us this gift of humility in order for me to live it. But I'll give you a few hints how to get to it. I'm sharing with you secrets of the spiritual path, some hints how to get to the level of being a true humble person, not by words, but by deeds. The most important thing for me to start looking at is to see my heart the way God sees it. To see my heart the way God sees it. You want to get to be, be being a humble person? You want to get to be a down-to-earth person? Start seeing your heart the way God sees it. My question to every one of us, if Jesus comes now and looks at us, how would he see my and your heart? You are the only person that can answer that question because I'm sure when you look inside of you, you know what kind of heart you have. And when I say heart here, I'm not talking about that bit of a muscle that pumps blood. When I say heart, or when the Bible mentions heart, it is your entire being, your inner person, the depth and the very core of your very existence. When Jesus looks at the depth of yourself, when you look at the depth of yourself, how do you see yourself? You see, the Lord said, 
It is not what goes in the person's mouth that defills the person. It is what comes out of the heart of that person that defills the man. And then he started listing what comes out of the heart of a person. When we look at the inside of us, how many evil things do we see inside of us taking place? How many bad thoughts? How many bad ways? What kind of life are we living? What kind of standards are we walking in and by? What are we looking at and how do we perceive things? Do you want to be humble? Look at your heart the way God sees it. You see, why do I say that? Because when you are preoccupied with your own self, guess what? You won't have the time to look at others. You won't have the time to be a judgmental person. A judgmental person has something very ugly in them, self-pride. Self-pride is a false glory that does not exist, but it only exists in your own imagination or in that person's imagination. And self-pride is a very big enemy of Jesus Christ. When I become preoccupied with my own self and I see the weaknesses of myself, the ugly pictures of myself, the mishaps of myself, the dark alleys in my inner soul, I am not going to be able to lift up my head in order to look and point the finger at someone else and say, these people are this and this and this and this, yet I am full of mistakes and errors and faults. When I look at myself, that is going to bring me to humility. Why? Because I will realize that I've got a lot of things that need fixing. You know what? Humble yourself, soul. Stop judging others and stop um, saying it's their fault. Once in your life, say it's my fault. It's not their fault. Humility, my beloved, humility is the level where we are able to have an encounter with the Lord Jesus. You want to meet Jesus? You want to get to know Jesus Christ? You know, so people say, well, where is the Lord? I've been praying. I don't hear nothing. I don't see nothing. You know, I've been asking. I've been calling. There is no reply. There is no answer. Jesus can only be found in humility. Jesus can only be found in humbleness and meekness. You want to meet Jesus Christ? You better get rid of that self-pride. You better get rid of that hopelessness and uselessness and giving up because Jesus is neither in pride nor in giving up. You know, John the Baptist, he was asked by the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests of his time. They said, what do you call yourself? What do you refer to yourself as? He said, I am the voice that cries out in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. For the mountains will be lowered. The valleys will be filled and lifted up. And the crooked path shall be straightened. Because the one who comes after me, who is before me, his path is straight forward. It's very humble. It's very simple. There is no twist about it. There is no going around and beating around the bush about it. The mountain is self-pride. Valleys, uselessness and hopelessness. I'm giving up. You know, valleys is like when you go and you shut the door behind you and you want to kill yourself. That is a valley. Jesus says, you want to meet up with your master, with your Lord and Savior, you better come out of that dark room of yours and have hope in life because I am your hope. And you want to meet up with Jesus? Don't have a big head and become a mountain and you think that you are number one and no one else is better than you. Lower yourself and humble yourself for my path is very straightforward. It's very straightforward. When we look at ourselves and see our errors and our sins, I don't think we'll have that opportunity to have the guts to call someone else a sinner, yet I am the sinner of them all. 
Humility gives me the opportunity to meet up with Jesus Christ. You know, where there is humility, it's going to lead you to something also extremely important, that is obedience. You see, a humble person is an obedient person. Someone who has self-glory and self-pride can never be obedient. No matter what you say to them, they will always be disobedient to you. They're not going to pay attention, and they're not going to do what you're asking of them because their self-pride and their self-dignity is too much for them to say, I'm sorry. They're not going to listen. So a humble person is an obedient person. A big-headed person is a disobedient person. But you see what happens? When you're humble, you are obedient, and obedience leads you to something that is of extreme importance, self-denial, sacrifice, the sacrifice of the cross. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Because out of his humility led him to obedience to his heavenly Father's will, and out of that obedience, it got him to dying on the cross willingly with a big smile on his face. The cross is, is about death. What is death? Self-denial. What is self-denial? I don't exist anymore. When someone dies, do you see them anymore? Okay. When you don't see a person, that means they don't exist anymore. True? Spiritually, we should not exist. Why? Because after Jesus purchased us with his precious blood, we all belong to him. It, he should be the one who should really appear in our life. He is the owner of this property. I don't own this property for me to do whatever I want. You know, it's like you go to a shop, a furniture shop, and you buy a piece of furniture, and then you come to take the furniture home, the furniture says, sorry, I'm not coming with you. What would you do to the furniture? I'm sure you'll get a sledgehammer, and you'll break it all, right? Can the furniture say to you, I'm not coming with you home after you paid for it? When you pay for something, that something becomes your property. You are free to do whatever you want with that property that you just paid the price for. Jesus paid the price for us on Calvary on the cross. He has full ownership and full right to do whatever he wants from us. Yet, since he has the right, he still comes and still say, would you like me to be your Lord? He still asks us. Yet he doesn't have to. Huh? He can come in anytime. He can break our head anytime. But he still comes and asks, because he is so much love that nobody can ever understand this kind of love. And we are still stubborn about the Lord. He has full ownership, but he still comes and asks, would you like me to do this for you? Will you allow me to come into your life? And me, the silly one, I still reject the Lord Jesus and say, sorry, I don't have the time for you. A humble person meets the Lord. When you meet the Lord Jesus, you become a very easygoing person. You will never complicate things, and you will never complicate people around you. You'll be just an easygoing. You know, you will be a content person. Maybe I've got nothing, but when I have Jesus, when I'm walking in that humility as if I'm owning the whole universe, not just this world, but the whole universe, I own everything. I'm so content, I've got nothing, but I'm very happy. With whatever I have, I am happy. A non-humble person is a person that whinges and complains about anything and everything. What kind of life is this? I can't believe it, I'm wearing the same dress twice. <laughs> My parents don't take me out to the movies. They don't buy me a car. They don't send me on holidays can't afford it. I'm sick and tired of this. I want to have a better life. A humble person says, how many people are living in the street? How many people are dying from starvation and hunger? And I've got a house and a shelter over my head. I thank you, Lord. I'm not worthy for all this. Maybe it's a small house, 
but some people live in the gutter, yet they might be better than me. A person with his own self and herself, build your life on humility. And to, to get to that level, look at your heart the way God sees it. See your heart the way God sees it. What kind of heart do I have? I ask this question and I need to answer this question. And if you don't know the answer to it, then you better start finding the answer. Otherwise, it's a big problem if you don't know what kind of heart you have. When somebody hurts you, what kind of heart do you have toward that person? When somebody digs beneath your feet, when somebody stabs you in the back, when somebody brings out some false rumors about you, when somebody tries to pull you down, when somebody steals your right, when somebody takes something that belongs to you, when somebody stops you from progressing and, and being a successful person, when somebody is an is you feel like they are an enemy to you. What kind of heart are you going to have toward that person? Do you want to go and really cut, chop their head off? What, how do you want to retaliate? What kind of action? What kind of, not an action, what kind of thought is it going to come into your head? On these bases, look at your heart and see what kind of heart you have. I tell you what kind of heart Jesus had and still has. He's on the cross. Listen to this, guys. Jesus Christ is God. He is the creator of every man, human being, the whole universe, angels, you name it. He's God. This very God came, the people who are his handmaid nailed him on the cross. They whipped him, they cut his body to pieces, and he is dying on the cross last moments very, with a very weak voice. He's almost dying. He's fading away. He looks, at in, he looks up in heaven. He says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. They do not know what they're doing. Now that is a humble heart. That is an obedient heart. That is a self-denial heart where he says, I do not exist you exist in me, my daddy. And it was your will, my father, for me to die on the cross. Therefore, I will not be angry with no one. Even my enemies who have ripped me apart, I will still ask you, daddy, to forgive them. A person with other people. Yeehaw. Now, what kind of foundation are you going to build yourself on as far as your relationship with other people? On what foundations are you building this relationship between you and others? Now, between you and yourself, you build it on humility in order to meet up with Jesus Christ. So therefore, you may be obedient, and then you deny yourself so that Jesus appears in you and your life more and more and more. Between you and others, the foundation you build that relationship on is through the holy baptism all of us have become a new creation. Therefore, all the indifferences between all of us have been abolished entirely through the holy baptism. What do I mean by that? The relationship between you and others, build it on this foundation. When you look at someone else, straight away remember, this is a Christian baptized soul. Through baptism, all of us, we became one. Galatians 3.27, St. Paul says, You who have been baptized into Christ have put on the Christ. Therefore, in baptism, every Christian soul, every baptized soul has become Christ. Your relationship with other Christian people, whether that be my brother, my sister, my father, my mother, my cousin, my relative, my friend, my work colleague, if they are Christians, I don't want to go into a non-Christians, but if they are Christians, that is one body. In baptism, all of us have put on the temple of God, which is Christ. And then St. Paul goes on and says, that all of us are members in this body. 
we make up the body of Jesus Christ. And Christ is the head of this body in Ephesians 5. Now, if we are members in the body of Christ, in this body, one member is a nose, one member is an eye, one member is an ear, the other member is a hand, the other one is a leg, the other one is a heart, the other one is the lungs, the liver, the veins, the blood. We are all members. St. Paul says in his epistles, he says, the eye cannot say, I do not need the ear. He's talking in a very simple terms, but so deep in theology, so deep. He says, the eye cannot say, I do not need the ear. My question to you, my beloved, is there a member more important than the other in this entire body? Is there one more important than the other? Is there? Can the hand say, I don't need the leg? You know what, I'm, I'm higher and I'm better looking. Can the eye say, I don't need the nose? The eyes are beautiful blue, green. With the lenses, they are rainbow, man. You know, the eye sees, her, sees itself so gorgeous, so beautiful, and then says, I am better than the nose. I am more important than the nose. I am greater than the nose. I am more precious than the nose. Can any member in this entire body say, I am better than the other one, or I am more important, or I don't need you, only me suffices? Eh? You take one member out of the body, the whole body collapses. Your relationship with others, you need to build it on baptism. Why? Because in baptism, all of us became the body of Christ, and we are members in that body. Therefore, we are as equal as one another. No one is greater than the other. No one is more important. No one is higher than the other. Then why do you differentiate between yourselves? Why? Why do you judge others and say, or make fun of some people and say, oh, you're an idiot. You've got a thick head, bro. I can see you through your head when you laugh. Is there any light up there? It looks kind of empty. Mm. Why do we make fun of people? Don't we realize we are all equal in the eyes of God? We are the members of his body, and every member is as important as the other one. Imagine you have the most beautiful eyes in the world, and you don't have ears to hear. And then Jesus Christ walks behind you. And he yells at you, hello, turn around and see me, please. I don't have ears, but I've got beautiful eyes. Can I hear his voice? Then what good are these good eyes for? Nothing. You see, the eyes without the ears, they do not function. And with every other member in the body, one member out, the entire body collapses, my beloved. Therefore, we should. When we have relationship with other people, we need to build it on baptism, meaning when I look at other people, I should see them as important and as equal as myself. I am no better than no one else. Then stop boasting about yourself. Come down from your high horse. There are some members in the body that are invisible to the naked eye. There are some members are external and some members are internal. Do you see the heart? No. Do you see the blood? No. Do you see the veins, the lungs, the liver? No. You don't see them, right? Therefore, there are some people who are members in the body of Jesus Christ that do not reveal their faith to you. They live a secretive lifestyle between themselves and Jesus Christ. And just because they don't talk much, just because they don't show the true picture of their faith, we make fun of them and we judge them. Yet we don't know, maybe we are living with some saints and we haven't taken notice of them. Never judge by what you see from outside because you do not know what the inside is. The only one who knows the inside is God. Don't look at a person just because of one behavior 
you start making some comments about this entire personality. What goes around, how do you want to be treated? You treat the others exactly the way you want to be treated. Jesus, our Lord and Savior said, he said, this is the law and the prophets. What does the Lord Jesus say? They means that whichever way you want to be treated, you treat the others. Do unto others as they do unto you. This is the law and the prophet. Do unto others as they do unto you. Some people misunderstand this statement and, and they think that the Lord is saying, do unto others as they do unto you. That means if they hurt you, belch them, brother. Well, that's what the Lord is saying. Do unto others as they do unto you. He punches me, I punch him. No, the Lord is saying, do unto others as they do unto you, meaning how do you want to be treated? You better treat people exactly that way. Do you want people to respect you? You better start respecting people. Do you want people to love you? You better start showing love to others. Do you want people to have, you know, some sort of a, a measure about you? Then you better start measuring other people's values. You go about talking about this and talking about that, putting this person down, some bad, ugly things about this person, and even even if what you're saying is true about that person. But since you have gone and told the whole world about it, then guess what? One day someone will come and tell you off and give you the third degree burns. Listen to what I'm saying, guys. First Corinthians 13, chapter 13 says, love hides a lot of errors. Love hides a lot of errors. A saint by the name of Macarius, Amba Makar, in the third century in Egypt. Saint Macarius, third century, about 1700 years ago. He was the leader of this monastic life. He had some student monks living under his guidance and, and leadership. One day he said, I'm gonna go to the room or the cell of this monk. I wanna pray with my brother monk. He was the father. Of, of these monks. So he went to the cell, to that room where this monk is, to pray with him. And as he opens the door to enter that room, he sees the monk with a woman. Now, you know, females are forbidden in monasteries. So you know what that monk was doing, right? When he saw that monk with that woman in the monastery, and this is the leader of the monastery, what does he do? He realized that the other monks are going to come because Saint Macarius, he was a saint for all the monks. Everyone knew this is a saint of God. So God will listen to him. So they would have taken notice where, we, where he went. So Saint Macarius realized that the monks had seen him going to that cell. He said, they're going to come and follow me. So what he did, he took that monk and that woman he put him in that big box. There was a big box in that room. He put him in there, put a lid onto it, and sat on that lid. And he bowed his head down as if he is praying in a very contemplative way, very deep. The other monks came after a few minutes, opened the door to come in to pray. They saw Amba Makario sitting on that box with his head down, going into the deep meditation, contemplation, and they said to one another, don't go in. We don't want to disturb him. He is in a intimate way with his Lord. Let's go back. They go back to their own cells. Saint Macarius lift up himself, goes out of that room. And as he was going toward his own room, he heard a voice from heaven, Macarius, Macarius, just like you hid the mistakes of your brother, so as Jesus Christ, will hide your mistakes on Judgment Day. How do you want to be treated at the end? Do you want to be glorified by your Lord? S talk about people in a respectful way. Say that everyone is a saint. I'm the only sinner. They're all good. I'm the only one who's bad. In the Holy Baptism, you are no longer Catholic. You are no longer Orthodox. You are no longer Chaldean. You are no longer Assyrian. You are no longer Italian. You are no longer Chinese. You are no longer Aussie. 
You are no longer Iraqi. You are no longer Lebanese. You are no longer Khabibi, whatever you want to name it. In the holy baptism, all of us became the body of Christ. No more names, no more nationalities, no more tribal backgrounds, no more dialects, no more names, no more nothing. We are all one family, one family. Is this how we look at it? If my own family, I see it as a stranger to me, then what would a stranger look to me then? If my own family, I differentiate myself from them, then what would I do with a total stranger? Isn't it a shame for Christians to differentiate themselves from one another? I go to a church, sorry, I can't marry you because you are not one of us. What do you mean I'm not one of you? Do I have like horns here and you don't have horns? For Jesus' sake, we are all Christians, brother. Sorry, I can't give you Holy Communion because you are not this specific Christian group. Where are you from? Sydney, Fairfield, Nita City? No, no, I mean, what kind of Christian are you? I'm a Christian. What do you mean, what kind of Christian? A little bit more in details. I'm Catholic. Oh, sorry, you're Catholic. Mm. Got your Pope. Can't give you the Holy Communion. You're not one of us, huh? What are you then? I'm Orthodox. What kind of Orthodox are you? Oh, I'm Greek. Oh, I'm Russian. Oh, I am a Syrian. Oh, I am Armenian. I am... Oh, just get a life, man. Do not differentiate. Do not differentiate. Your relationship between you and God. Between you and yourself, build it on the foundation of humility. See your heart the way God sees it. To be humble. Look at your errors. Stop, you know, wasting your time looking at people's errors. Look at your own one because I'm sure you've got plenty of it. Your relationship between you and others, build on the foundation of baptism. We are all one in the body of Jesus Christ, and all members are as equal as one another. No, other, no one member is more valuable than the other. No one. Oh, by the way, speaking of these members, the, the most pure member in the entire body is your face. This piece of information for you guys. The most impure member in the body is the nose. The cleanest body member is the face. The dirtiest member in the body is the nose. How much time do we spend on the face and on the nose? I can assure you, my beloveds, and I'm saying this to the girls mainly, because the girls like to stand in front of a mirror for about 10 hours, putting about 10 ton of makeup. I gotta put the foundation, I got some cracks. You know, I gotta put the undercoat and then putty, and then, and then I gotta sand it off. And then I gotta get the pen and draw some eyelids and eyelashes and I don't know what. But even if you spend a couple of hours putting up on that makeup, but I can assure you 24 hours, whether you know it, Directly or indirectly, your hand goes up onto your nose and you play with it and you clean it and you make sure it is clean. And you do that so naturally, you don't even think about it. And a lot of times, you do it without even realizing it because it is so natural instinct for you to, to really touch your nose and make sure it's clean. Why? Because you don't want to be found embarrassed in front of people that there is something sticking out of your nose. So, the filthiest member, listen to this now, the filthiest member in the entire body is the nose, and it is the most spent time on out of all the members. The cleanest member, the face, I don't even look at it, but the filthiest member of all, I spend most of my time making sure it is clean, it is tidy. St. Paul says we are members in the body. He says... If you are a face, i.e., if you see yourself as a good Christian, if you see yourself as a saint in the eyes of yourself and Jesus Christ, then when you see another brother or a sister who is a nose meaning living in sin, instead, in, instead of pointing the finger at them, instead of judging them, instead of making fun of them, instead of humiliating them, why don't you go and pick them up and clean them up just like you clean your nose? When a person walks into the church, 
and we know this person very well. They could be a drug addict, an alcoholic, very ugly and very dirty in their life. And you are sitting in the church and this person walks into the church because somehow the Lord Jesus had touched their hearts and they just said, I'm going to go for the first time in my life to the church. And you as Christians, so-called followers of Jesus Christ, so-called people that should be bringing people who are distant from the Lord to the church, you're sitting in the church and then the Lord brings this missing person, this lost sheep, he brings it to the church. What do we do when we see this person walking into the church and yet we know them, what kind of people they are? We scan them from head to toe. We scan them, my beloved, a hundred times. With the eyes going up and down on them, with the eye we say to them, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. This is a place for clean people, not for dirty people like you. Yet I am more dirty than that person. The Holy of Holies, Jesus Christ, never hesitated to touch a leper, never hesitated to eat with the adulterous. And I, the sinner, I see it too much. I can't accept this and I can't touch this and I can't talk to this because they are not from my level. If you see someone as a nose, meaning living in sin, show mercy. If you want God to show mercy on you, don't judge. Don't judge. Between you and God, you build that relationship on the foundation of love. Between you and God, you build that relationship on the foundation of love. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, Matthew chapter 22, 37, Luke chapter 10, 27. It starts with Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, and then there is a reference pointed to Deuteronomy in Matthew 22, 37, and in Luke 10, 27. What does, it, what does the Lord God say to Adam and to all of us in Deuteronomy 6, 5? He says, Adam, you love your Lord God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and all your strength, and you love your neighbor like your... A relationship between you and God is built on the foundation of love. And when you love God, you will love your neighbor like you love yourself. A person that does not have the love of Jesus in their heart can never love their neighbor like themselves. And your neighbor can be anyone. Your neighbor can be your dad, your mom, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your next door neighbor, a Christian, a Hindu, and a Muslim, an atheist. Anyone is your neighbor. Can you love that neighbor like yourself? The question is, how far are we from God? How far are we? Love, my beloveds, foundational. Like when you come to build a house, without a foundation, don't talk about the walls, the doors, the windows, the roof, the ceiling, the don't talk about nothing. Unless you lay the foundation down, then you can start talking about the structure. Without love, don't talk about, you know, I'm this and I'm this and I'm this and I'm that and I'm this and I'm that. Don't. Unless there is love in us, we cannot talk about nothing else. It is foundational. Without a foundation, there is no house. There is no life. God, God is this foundation. For St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, three things remain in any person. That is faith, hope, and love. But the greater of all is love. Why? Because God is love. You build your relationship with God on the basis of love. You build it on the basis of love, my beloveds. I'll give you a, a small piece of information for someone that does not believe in God. You know, sometimes, you know, you get asked, oh, we get asked, they say, you know, if someone that does not believe in God, an atheist, you know, if they say that where is God and uh, how, do we, how do we reply to them? My question is, can any person on the face of this planet say, I did not experience love or I do not know that there is love? 
you must have experienced that love in one way or another, whether it be a friendship, a father to a son, a mother to a daughter, brother to a sister, so whatever relationship it is, you must have experienced love in one way, form, shape, or another. You must have. Then my question is, where did this love come from? St. Paul, when he talks about this love, he calls it the great mystery. Imagine a person giving birth. The moment this female gives birth to this child, this gush of love and intimacy runs in the entire being of this, this person, and they are so affectionate towards this, this child. They are so compassionate, so devotional to this child. Where did this instinct reaction come from? Where did this love come from? In animals, in every creation of God, there is this element of love. It's a great mystery because I can never fully fathom it, comprehend it, understand it, swallow it. I can only taste it and allow myself to live it. But I can't fully understand it. Why? Because God is this love and God is infinite. I can never fully understand God. You see, for an atheist, the most common question they ask about the existence of God as they say this to you. It is 99.999% this question will be asked from an atheist person about God's existence. They will say to you, you as Christians, you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes, He is the true divine God, yes. And you believe that this God is all love? Yes. He is all powerful? Yes. He is in charge of everything. He is the supreme authority. Everything is under His rulership. So He can do anything and everything. And He is all love. Yes, 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 yes. Well, can you then explain to me, oh, this God that you believe in that is all love and all powerful, how come this all loving God and all powerful God is allowing for all this evil to be in this world? That is the most common question by an atheist. Why is he allowing this evil if he is all love and all power? If he's got all the power, shouldn't he stop it? If he's all love, why didn't he allow, why did he allow evil to come in? I'll answer it this way. You know what? When you answer a questioner with a question, you are letting that questioner to open up within their own assumptions. You know, you answer a questioner with a question. You see, if you read in the Bible, not if you read, when you read in the Bible. <laughs> when people came and asked the Lord Jesus a question, the Lord answered them with a question. Why? Because when you reply to them with a question, then you're going to make them think about their question. When a person says to you, why is there evil in the world? So they are acknowledging that there is evil. Are you with me, guys? You paying attention? Why do you look around when you hear a noise? One habit you need to get rid of. I'm sitting in the church during the Mass. Somebody walks in. None of my business. The church goes on fire. None of my business. None of my business. I'm in the presence of the Lord. I'm listening to His Word. That's none of my business. We need to learn. We need to learn. If the person says to you, why is there so much evil? Looks like they are acknowledging there is evil. Otherwise, they wouldn't have said it. And there is evil in the world. And my question to that person is, you are saying that there is evil, therefore you are assuming there is good. Because if there was no good, where did evil come from? When you say there is darkness, you must assume there is light. Otherwise, how did you know this is darkness if you did not see the light? You with me? So if you're saying there is evil, then you are assuming there is good. Yes? They will say yes. Now, since you're assuming there is good, then you are assuming there is a moral law. Because without a moral law, how can you differentiate between good and evil? There must be a moral law that in order for you to differentiate between good and evil. Yes? Yes. So since there is a moral law, my dear friend, then you must assume there is a moral law giver because information must come from a source. 
That is science. So since there is a moral lawgiver, but what you're doing, my dear friend, you're coming and you are denying the very source. The moral lawgiver is God. So since you are denying the existence of God, therefore you are denying the moral law. And since you are denying the moral law, then you are denying good. And since you are denying good, then you are denying evil. Then what's your question? Did you get it? Logic. Makes sense. We ask questions, yet we do not understand what we are saying or asking. Build your relationship with the Lord Jesus on the basis of love. Ask Him. Say, Lord, I want to be with you. I want to live for you. I want to walk with you. I want to follow you. I want to be the person that your name is glorified in me. Lord Jesus, give me the foundation of all foundations. Your love, let it fill my heart, let it fill my soul, my mind, my whole being. Jesus, I want to live in your love. Teach me. Give me your heart and take my heart. Give me you and take me. Let us swap. Lord, I want to see the world through your eyes. I want to hear people through your ears. And I want to have a relationship with others the way you did, my Lord. Ask. Jesus is the living God. He will give you when you ask of him. And he will prove to you that I am the living Messiah. You know, we just came from the Holy Land. The tomb of the Lord Jesus in the sepulcher church cries out every year without a fail on the Saturday, the Saturday before Sunday resurrection, on the Sabbath, the Saturday, every year without fail, on Easter, Saturday, the candles get lit from, miraculously from the tomb of the Lord Jesus, the empty tomb of the Lord Jesus. A beautiful, so extreme light comes out of the tomb the candle gets lit by that beam of light and fire. The candle for the first 33 seconds, it is only light. There is no heat in it. So you can take a big bunch of candles and a big humongous inferno. For the first 33 seconds, you can put your head into it. It will not burn you. It's only light. And then after 33 seconds, try to touch it. It'll become a sausage sizzler, brother. And what happens throughout the year? If you go and light a candle from the candle that was lit by the light that came out of the tomb of the Lord Jesus, for the first 33 seconds, it is only light. So you go now and you light a candle, you buy any candle, and you go and light it from the candle that was lit from the tomb of the Lord. For the first 33 seconds, it is only light. There is no heat in it throughout the whole year, anytime. Now, what else does the Lord? That's just one of the things that he shows. Millions of things he shows every day. Just to prove that I am the living Messiah. I'm the only one. I'm the only way. When I said I'm the way, the truth, and the life, I, I meant it because I am. When I said I'm God, I meant it because I am. When I said if you believe in me, if even if you die, you will live, I meant it because I mean everything I say. When I said, if you receive me in the Holy Eucharist, if you take my body in faith, you believe that this is my body, and you drink my blood in faith, you believe it's my blood, you will never die. You will live in me forever. I meant it because I mean what I say, because I am God. I don't go back on my word. I am very faithful to my word. When Jesus said, I, I will be crucified, I will die in the flesh, I will be buried, but I will rise on the third day, I meant it, I did. The tomb is empty. I show the miracle every year. I said I'm the light of the world. The light comes out of the empty tomb. And a grave, a dark grave brings out life. Light means life. So when Jesus gives light every Sabbath on that Sunday resurrection, the day before Sunday resurrection, he is saying out of the grave came out life eternal. And that life is the light that you see your path with. I am your light, I am your path, and I am the life.
of that path. You better believe in the Lord. And I am love because love is light. Love is life. Love is the way. And there is no other way. It is the most powerful tool, weapon that you could ever use in life is love. The most powerful weapon. You know, when you love your enemy, woo, you'll chop them to pieces. You know, when people try to get to you just to make you angry and just to make you nervous and just to make you retaliate and you keep your cool, like you are cool as a cucumber, and you bless them and you say, I love you, you're so sweet. You know, when you told me off, that just made me feel so good. I love you. You know what you do to that person? They become like an Indian hot pepper. They become a choo-choo train, Thomas the Tank. Love never fails, my beloved. Always ask the Lord to grant you this gift, the ultimate gift. Make me live your love and allow me to share your love in this so dark, envious world. Division is everywhere, my Lord. Hatred is everywhere. Envy, jealousy, betrayal is everywhere. Give me that love so that I can carry it with me and give it to wherever it's needed most. Every single human being, when they were born, they were born like an angel. No one was born to be a murderer. No one was born to be a drug addict. No one was born to be a, an alcoholic. No one was born whatever thing that they be, have become. Everyone was an angel. A little innocent baby. If you go and sit with a murderer, an alcoholic, a drug addict, whatever, generally speaking, 99% of the time you will see that they lacked love from childhood. They are not bad people. They were not loved enough when they were little angels. When a spirit becomes a demon, that spirit lacks love. That's why it becomes a demon, an ugly looking being. Love is the thing, the secret thing that brings beauty into existence. When you have the love of Christ in your heart, you will be a smiley face. You know, I would hate going into a church and see everyone in the church grumpy. What kind of an, an, an image reflection of Jesus Christ is that? Yeah, they say, oh, Jesus is the way. When you go to him, you're happy, you're this. And I'm a Christian, I'm the, the, the grumpiest person in, on the face of this planet. I, I don't want to go into a church and everybody is looking at me. I want to go in there and I want to see that they are a welcoming people. They've got a smile on their face. Hello, oh, welcome. You're part of the furniture, you're part of the family. Oh, you're one of us. Hello, we love you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, uh, see you next week. We can't wait to see you. Be like that. Today I can't talk to no one. Everybody's angry. Hello, what? <laughs> Nothing, I'm just saying hello. Well, don't say hello again, okay? Do you need anything? No, do you think I can't ask if I really wanted anything? Okay, relax. John Wayne, bro. The secrets of the path between you and yourself, build it on humility. Look at your heart the way God sees it. It will lead you to humility. Between you and others, build it on the foundation of baptism. We are all equal members in the body of Christ. No one is better than the other one. Love each other. Between you and God, build it on the basis of love. Lord Jesus, give me how to live your love and how to share your love. When you build your life on the humility between you and yourself, you are sanctifying the life that you have been invited into. You are sanctifying the life. When you build your relationship with others on the basis of baptism, being united into the body of Christ, you are sanctifying the brotherly relationship. We are all the same. That's the sanctity of relationship. No one is better than the other one. This is holiness. And when you build your life between you and God on the basis of love, you are sanctifying the relationship between you and Christ on the basis of prayer. 
How do I sanctify my relationship between me and Christ? Prayer, my beloved. Pray to the Lord. Prayer is the license given to heaven to interfere with earthly matters. Prayer is the license given to heaven to interfere with earthly matters. God cannot interfere with your affairs until you give him the license to do so. The prayer is the license that makes God free to interfere with your life. Pray about everything. When you get up, say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning. That is a prayer. When you eat, before you eat, thank you for this food, my Lord. This is a prayer. When you come to leave the house, safeguard me, my Lord, on the way out and be with me all the way to the workplace, to the school, to the church, to wherever I'm going. But don't go clubbing, brother. Safeguard me wherever I'm going. That is a prayer. When you come back from work, school, wherever you're coming back from, except clubbing him, <laughs> say, Lord, let's go back home and be with me so that I may be protected in this way till I get home. That is a prayer. When you come to sleep, say, Lord, I thank you for this day until this moment that I have, you have kept me in one piece. Nothing has harmed me. Nothing has touched me. I thank you for this great gift. I thank you for your love. Remember him, my beloved. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, I'm going to sleep, but please be with me in my sleep so that no ugly images and dreams come my way. You safeguard me while I'm asleep. That is a prayer. The Lord said, pray all the time without ceasing. When you ask the Lord to be in your sleep, when, when you sleep, you can't pray. But when you ask him to be in your sleep, then your entire time of, that you're sleeping, that you are praying because you ask him to be in your prayer. What is a prayer? A prayer is to be connected to Jesus Christ. So every time you connect yourself to him, you are praying. When you stand in the church and say, our Father who art in heaven, you're praying. When you go and visit someone in hospital, in the name of Jesus Christ, you're taking Jesus to that hospital. You are praying. When you're sending money to someone in Africa, in the name of Jesus Christ, you're praying. A prayer is not words. A prayer is connectivity with Jesus Christ. Whatever connects you to Jesus, that is a prayer, whether it be words or deeds. If it's done for the Lord, it is a prayer. You can pray all the time. It's very easy. And when you slip, don't just say Jesus Christ because using his name in vain is a sin. We use that, don't we? Like we've, we got used to this habit, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. That is a sin. We are using his name in vain. But when you do something and you slip and you fall and you say, Jesus Christ, please help me. <laughs> Add a couple of words to it. You're going to save yourself. It becomes a prayer instead of a burden on you. Remember the Lord. He will remember you always. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Let's stand for the finale prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you, guide you, and protect you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you so much, guys.